It's uh, a great honor to be here uh, today. I'm really grateful to uh, Simon and to the organizers of this uh, conference. Uh, I first met Simon probably 20 years ago when he was a research student. Um, uh, and sometime after that, I'm not sure whether consequently, uh, he left academia for business and we all felt what a loss to uh, uh, history and Irish history that was. But his wonderful work with this festival, I think, has proved, uh, proved us all wrong. And uh, I want to start my remarks this evening by wishing him and his committee uh, every success, every continuing success for this, this wonderful enterprise. I'm uh, grateful, too, to him in, uh, in another way. The, um, the accidents of timetabling have meant that uh, I have the uh, opening slot this, this afternoon. And this has, uh, I'm very glad to say, given me some spurious street credibility with my family, my children back in Edinburgh, because it means that I can casually tell them, as indeed I have done, that uh, I've been asked to uh, open the West Cork Festival while an actor called Jeremy Irons has only been asked to cover the uh, closing session. <laughs> Redmond and Carson were the two greatest Irish parliamentarians of uh, their generation. They were perhaps the best known Irishmen uh, of the time. And their achievements and their mistakes have lastingly shaped the political landscape of this island and indeed of the neighboring island. Their careers say a great deal about the multinational union state where they found themselves. And their careers, and in particular the politics of 100 years ago, speak to other concerns which have a real uh, contemporary connection. And I'll, I'll seek to return to that theme at the, uh, at the end of my remarks. So I suppose the first thought that I want to consider very briefly is why has there been no venture of uh, this kind, this comparative kind, or at any rate no sustained venture before now? And it seems to me that this is worth asking because it's notable that uh, comparative political biography is a commonplace across various national historiographies, but it is relatively underdeveloped within an Irish context, and the question, therefore, arises why that might be. And I think it's because the kinds of connection which might be made between constitutional nationalist and physical force nationalist, uh, between nationalist and unionist, cut across still acute sensitivities. And it's also the case that the two lives have been separated out by the division of the island into two popular and opposing political narratives. Partitionist history is and can be defined in all sorts of ways, but one definition is surely dealing with Irish nationalism and Irish unionism exclusively in separate silos and ignoring common political environments, cross-fertilization of ideas, and cross-communication, however fractious that communication might be. And yet, uh, with these two, though the parallels are clear, uh, they have been very, very rarely emphasized. They were of the same mid-1850s Irish generation. They were educated at the same university, Trinity College Dublin. They each studied at King's Inns. They pursued the same profession, the law. There was evidence with each of political diversity in, the, in terms of their backgrounds. Redmond had relatives uh, uh, engaged with the 1798 Rising. He had relatives uh, within loyalism. And Carson had relatives uh, who were separatist as well. There was an overlap in their personal circumstances. They were each widowers, each widowed uh, and eventually remarrying. They were marginal to the movements that they led. Redmond, a Parnellite, came to lead an Irish party 
dominated by anti-Parnellism. Carson, the Dublin Unionist, uh, moved north in 1910 to uh, lead uh, uh, Ulster Unionism, or at any rate, an Irish Unionism dominated by the north. They both led vociferous movements, fragmenting movements, which had violent edges or dimensions. And they both had to devise strategies to hold their respective uh, enterprises together. It's frequently forgotten that uh, while we know about the span of opinion across uh, Irish nationalism, it's less frequently recognized that Irish unionism in the Edwardian era is, uh, in, uh, is affected by uh, a range of uh, schisms of one kind or another. The two men were both lawyers who broke the law, albeit in different ways and with different uh, uh, magnitudes. Redmond was imprisoned for incitement uh, in 1888. Carson, of course, was uh, complicit in defying uh, a ban on the importation of weapons into Ireland and signed off on the mass importation of weapons uh, into the North in early 1914. They sat together for 26 years in the one parliament. They were tireless political opponents, but professed a friendship uh, and a mutual respect. Of course, one was a home ruler, the other a unionist, that they, yet they shared uh, a range of, well, pretty unprogressive sympathies, monarchical, imperial, uh, and indeed anti-suffragist. They were also federalists. And I think their fate involves some similarity as well in terms of reputation. Some years ago, a friend and colleague at uh, Trinity College Dublin, Kieran Brady, produced a set of Thomas Davis lectures, which he published uh, as a book called Worsted in the Game. The quote is from uh, Canon Sheehan of Donorail. Worsted in the Game, uh, from a poem uh, on Ochram. And within this collection, Worsted in the Game, Losers in Irish History was the subtitle. Uh, Carson and Redmond uh, uh, naturally featured. And of course, contemporaries of all kinds linked them. Um, their own family got together uh, and interconnected. Uh, one of the minor uh, discoveries that underpins the volume is that uh, Harry Carson, Edward's son, and Louis Redmond Howard, uh, John Redmond's nephew, each collaborated in presenting a number of, how shall I describe them, patricidal, patricidal critiques of their uh, elders, either through journalism or uh, uh, through a co-written one-act melodrama which appeared in 1914. Yet, from the time of partition on, they have uh, rarely been brought together and never really compared in a sustained manner. So let me work through each of these ob observations and try to say a little bit more about the, uh, the personal uh, construction of these individuals and the political implications of that. I've said they were the same Irish generation. Redmond's parents, however, were estranged. Um, Carson was the favored sibling in an emotionally relatively stable family environment. Redmond was from the Catholic professional and landed classes. There's a bit of money there in terms of his background. Carson's family, though, is out of East. And there are hints of a somewhat disreputable, a somewhat loose quality. Carson, remember, is not, uh, though a southern Protestant, is not a landed Protestant. He comes from the Dublin middle and uh, professional classes. And there's evidence that his father made money as an architect and uh, property developer. But at the time of his death, there was very little liquidity. Uh, his mother was left in what were described as straitened circumstances. So in other words, Redmond was materially secure, but perhaps emotionally less so in terms of his background circumstances. Carson was well anchored in terms of his family's affections, 
but he felt materially threatened, uh, and threatened in terms of his health as well. There are these kind of twin motifs in his correspondence, health and money, and the two are interlinked. Uh, if his health fails, he can't work as a barrister. If he can't work as a barrister, there is no income, and he's back to where his father had been at the time of uh, the latter's death in the early 1880s. So you have these neuroses, as I might describe them, throughout Carson's correspondence, virtually until the day he dies in 1935, at the age of 81, uh, leaving uh, uh, £150,000, the equivalent today of perhaps €10 million. Euros. The two men studied at King's Inns. They pursued the same legal career. But here the similarity ends. Carson can be defined by his social and his uh, professional role as a lawyer. Politics really are an extension of the law for Carson. And for Redmond, I think it's exactly the other way around. Uh, the law is an extension of politics. Redmond's court cases usually involve the protection of the farming interest. Carson's success in the law courts generates huge political leverage in the late Victorian and Edwardian Parliament. Um, it's often forgotten that at the very cusp of the Home Rule Crisis of 1910, 1911 uh, and after, uh, uh, Carson is in the courts defending a youngster called George Archer Shee. Uh, this is the case that was dramatized by Terence Rattigan as the Winslow boy the naval cadet who is accused of forging a signature on a five-shilling postal order and is uh, kicked around in consequence by the Admiralty. Carson comes to his, uh, his defense. Recent history weighs heavily with the two men and their outlook. The legacy of the Parnell split is, uh, of course, a non-going challenge for John Redmond and it illuminates, I think, his own ongoing concern for unity. This is the central motif in some ways of his political career. In some ways, Redmond, I think it might be said, is loyal to the letter, but not necessarily the spirit of Parnellism. And Carson has, I think, uh, a variety of historical legacy and, uh, and baggage as well, which again is, uh, is explored uh, uh, a bit in the book. Carson, I think, is clearly influenced by a particular uh, reading of the history of successive British governments' willingness to respond to uh, Irish political mobilization. Carson has to navigate a Northern Unionism, which, as I've mentioned, was divided throughout the early mid and uh, uh, the early and mid Edwardian era. And finally, in terms of this section, each is a compromise leader. Each, I think, is circumscribed by this to some extent. The arguments in this respect, so far as Redmond uh, uh, is concerned, are well known. Um, he is in a vulnerable position after 1900 as a leader of a, an ostensibly reunified Irish party. But Carson, I think, is in all probability a compromise leader for Northern Unionism as well. And I think it's likely to be the case that a variety of Northern Unionist contenders effectively cancel themselves out in 1910, allowing Carson to emerge as the leader of the, uh, uh, the Unionist enterprise. So I'm arguing to you that each of these men works within a particular set of personal legacies. But each also, of course, works within a particular uh, political environment. And what I want to do in the next section of my talk is to say something about the cultures of the Union state, the multinational Union state, uh, uh, at the end of the 19th and the early 20th centuries. Now, you'll be relieved to know that I'm not proposing to uh, open up a general lecture on the nature of uh, constitutional unions uh, in the modern period. Let me simply say, or let me make a number of, uh, uh, I hope, uh, straightforward points. 
The first is that uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland is frequently seen, uh, uh, certainly by Irish and British historians, uh, in, in isolation. But it is one of only, it, it's, it's one of several multinational union states which are emerging in early and mid 19th century Europe, sometimes in the context of the Napoleonic Wars, but uh, not, not always. The UK, like many of these other unions, is, of course, an asymmetrical union. There is one overwhelmingly predominant partner and several smaller partners, Ireland and Scotland, of course. Empire is often conceptually relevant to these union states insofar as they were not only connected often with overseas colonization, but were sometimes, as in the British case, founded upon uh, forms of internal colonialism. As Theo Hoppen, uh, uh, a great Irish historian, has recently reminded us all, the politics of Westminster through much of the period of the Union, the 19th and early 20th centuries, were characterized by a relative ignorance of Ireland, a relative lack of any, uh, any lastingly coherent vision of Union, and this expresses itself in cyclical shifts between integrationist approaches to the government of Ireland and exceptionalist or even devolutionist approaches. And I think the corollary of this is that Irish politicians, whether nationalist or unionist, find themselves fighting for attention and then fighting to educate or to inform British ministers and party leaders. And the flow on from this is the deepening of political division within Ireland itself, since competing parties tended to look for external support and validation rather than uh, naturally internal reconciliation. And it should be said that you know, this pathology is not unique to Britain and Ireland. It's perceptible with some of these other union states that I'm briefly alluding to. It's also very much a feature of Central Europe, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire after 1867. Uh, and indeed, Austria-Hungary is uh, looked to in a variety of respects very frequently by Irish uh, and, to a lesser extent, British political commentators in this era. So how does all this relate specifically to the two protagonists uh, uh, that are currently supporting my uh, lecture? They have a low-key but consistent friendship from the 1880s right through to John Redmond's death in 1918. Um, they correspond with, with each other at times of uh, family or emotional crisis. And again, there's one or two pieces of evidence in the book that you can see to uh, document this uh, proposition. But there is, uh, there is a strange absence and that strange absence is that there is very little evidence to suggest that at times of political as opposed to personal crisis, that they get their heads together and seek to, uh, seek to negotiate. Each of them on these occasions looks primarily to their British uh, uh, partner parties for support and endorsement. So there's a great deal of emotion. Uh, there's a great deal of fraternal feeling. Um, but there is, as a default position, a looking to Toryism and, and, and liberalism. And you can see this, for example, at the Buckingham Palace Conference over home rule and prospectively partition in July 1914 when uh, the, uh, the various Irish party leaders, uh, uh, both Carson and Redmond, uh, uh, shed tears. But they don't actually do a deal. I think for each, all of this carries an ongoing risk of dependency or of clientelism, which in the past is offset by highly combative personalities in terms of nationalism, Daniel O'Connell uh, or Parnell. And I think there are distinctions between the ways in which Carson navigates the politics of the Union Parliament and successive Union governments uh, and Redmond's ways. Now, Carson in 1912-1914 has some critical advantages over Redmond. British conservatism at this time is increasingly reliant upon uh, the Union 
as a unifying mechanism since the party was otherwise bitterly divided over um, its trading relationship with the wider world. Uh, uh, ring any bells? Uh, in the Edwardian period, it's called tariff reform, as distinct to free trade. Uh, the Conservative Party in this era, uh, in the run-up to 1911, is also bitterly divided over its leadership. The, uh, the incumbent leader, Arthur Balfour, is highly vulnerable, subject to uh, grumbling attacks. Again, ring any bells. I think the Conservatives' embroilment in Ireland and in Ulster at this time obscures the fact that Carson had, in reality, largely liberated himself from Westminster politics by the popular political mobilization which has developed in the North after 1911-1912. And the central irony of the period uh, is, of course, that the strength of Redmondite nationalism rests inside the British Parliament with the Liberal Alliance, while the strength of unionism lies in Ireland itself, or at any rate, uh, in the north of Ireland. The problem for Redmond is that he's coping with a still fragile constitutional nationalist tradition, seeking to collaborate with a liberalism which is sympathetic towards, but actually at the end of the day, not passionate about home rule. It's a liberalism which as Asquith himself said in 1913, believed that the nationalists without the support of the Liberal Party are powerless. The nationalists without the support of the Liberal Party are powerless. And I think for Redmond, this relative weakness expresses itself in terms of uh, lack of communication from Liberal ministers. There are times when... Uh, uh, metaphorically speaking, Asquith's mobile phone is switched off. It expresses itself in terms of debilitating, what I might describe as debilitating partial affirmation. It expresses itself in terms of broken promises, these being particularly evident in uh, the late winter, February, March 1914, over the issue of partition, and in June, July 1916, at the time of the Lord George negotiations. I think the impact on Redmond of this is, is uh, palpable and is clear in terms of his discourse. His vocabulary and pitch in dealing with ministers were often seemingly those of a supplicant, he frequently pleads for fair play. It's only fair play if you do this for me. I think given X, you should in all fair play do Y. Characteristic motif of his correspondence across the range of his engagement with liberal ministers is anxious petitioning. Characteristic tone, on the other hand, is frequently offended gentility. Redmond himself confides on one occasion that he felt really humiliated, his words, really humiliated in having to run after them, British ministers, in the way that I have done. Really humiliated in having to run after them in the way that I have done. Turning briefly to wider contexts uh, in terms of this theme, most analysis of the survival or demise of union states multinational union states in 19th century uh, and the early 20th century, stresses the role of a variety of institutions, often the monarchy and the associated institutions of monarchy, like the crown forces, as critical binding agents and as engines of a supranational uh, uh, state identity. Redmond and Carson are primarily Irish in terms of their identity. Carson, indeed, is accused throughout his legal and, indeed, his political career of a stage Irishness. Carson retains his uh, uh, emphatic Dublin accent until his dying day. Uh, and, indeed, it's seen by uh, jealous professional rivals in the law court as a devastating advantage to him. 
in, uh, in appealing to the juries. Each acknowledges, however, beyond this Irishness, a supranational set of imperial and monarchical loyalties. Redmond's monarchism and imperialism, his commitment to the British war effort, his controversial commitment to the British war effort, are generally seen in highly unflattering terms as a kind of unacceptable loyalism or crypto-unionism. But there's a case, I think, for understanding him in terms of some of these wider horizons, both historically as well as geographically. I think he stands within a tradition of O'Connellite nationalist loyalty, if I can put it like that. But he also stands in a wider European tradition of nationality and engagement with the state, brokered through the agency of key institutions like the Crown uh, uh, or the Crown forces. You could be in 19th century Europe, you could be a Norwegian nationalist and be uh, loyal to the Bernadotte monarchy of the United Kingdoms of Sweden and Norway. You could be a Hungarian patriot and loyal to the Habsburg rulers of the dual monarchy. I think Redmond and Carson's fundamental characteristic was that they reflected the hybridity of Irish, much Irish political culture under the Union. The Janus faced looking simultaneously to national themes as well as supranational. And again, this is not or should not be particularly surprising if you look at work on uh, political identity within other multinational polities. And again, I think of Austria-Hungary, where a generation of scholarship led by Peter Judson has emphasized the layering and the linkages of, uh, of identity. Now, I think um, the title of this talk has promised you uh, uh, those gentle topics of bloodshed and partition, so let me uh, honor my legal obligations to you and think a little bit about the issue of bloodshed in terms of political violence and then look briefly at, um, at the no less gentle issue of partition. I think violence, whether real or threatened, is a feature of these European United Kingdoms of the 19th century, unsurprisingly so, since these supranational uh, unions were being constructed at precisely the uh, moment of mounting national uh, sentiment. So some of those unions that I've mentioned or raised, Sweden-Norway is characterized throughout its uh, near 190-year history by uh, 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 threats of military action, uh, particularly by the Swedes. The United Kingdom of the Netherlands dissolves uh, in 1830, 1831, in the context uh, of an armed revolt in its southern province, what is now Belgium. The Austro-Hungarian dual monarchy after 1867 is characterized by low-key violent tensions. In each of the two careers, these two Irish careers, uh, poses questions about how essentially constitutional politicians operate in a society where there are strong cultures either celebrating or practicing violent resistance. And let me make a couple of points in trying to illuminate this theme. To start with, uh, I think, a watertight distinction between constitutionalist and militant in modern Irish history, uh, while tempting, is generally hard to sustain. There is, I think, in fact, some analytical value behind uh, Sean Lamass's sometimes derided notion of being slightly constitutional. Why does the constitutionalist John Redmond shift to a greater militancy then as he does in 1913-1914? He does so, I think, as a response to Carsonite mobilization in the north of Ireland. I think that much is clear. But the question also has to be grasped in terms of his own long-standing relationship with physical force nationalism, 
Redmond has a strong sense of the history of national insurgency. He was at the forefront of the centenary commemorations of the 98 Rising. He had uh, strong links with Fenians and Fenianism in the 1890s. The issue was never that he lacked an engagement with Fenianism. The issue by 1914 is rather that, as is the case elsewhere in Redmond's political career, the world had moved on. He doesn't oppose political violence in principle. He sees conditions in which the Irish might legitimately resort to arms. And I think there are overlaps here with uh, the Catholic notion of the just war. One aspect of his reasoning certainly relates to the overwhelming strength of British firepower. The impracticality, therefore, of any Irish assault, the inevitability of bloody Irish defeat. I think this perhaps begins to answer another question that's sometimes posed who not always answered about Redmond in 1912, 1914. The question being, why is he so unimpressed by unionist militancy? Why doesn't he get that these northerners are ostensibly serious? And I think the reason is essentially because he believes that he understands and shares their strategic calculations. At Maryborough in 1900, Redmond uh, uh, affirmed that his words, I have no faith and never had in any English party. We have never got anything without labor or suffering or sacrifice on our part or without making a movement dangerous and menacing towards England. Without making a movement dangerous and menacing towards England. And there are other examples of this kind of uh, philosophizing. In 1908, for example, There are friends of ours who say that any violent action in Ireland will alienate support here in Britain. But the sounder view is that you've got in some way or another once more to impress the English mind that the Irish question is a real and urgent one. So in my view, in Redmond's reading, Carson's militants in 1912, 1914 were bluffing because, like him, they understood that tackling the overwhelming military might of the British Empire would produce a bloodbath. But he also knew that they were bluffing because he believed that he saw that they, like Irish nationalists, were primarily seeking to, in his phrase, impress the English mind through their militant postures. That they were creating, again in his words, a movement dangerous and menacing to England. And what about Carson? Carson's shift to militancy in 1910-1914. This uh, ostensible paragon of the law courts moving to uh, command the paramilitary enterprise and signing off in 1914 on the importation of 25,000 rifles and 3 million rounds of ammunition which arrive in Larne in East Antrim in April 1914. I think militancy uh, within Northern Unionism comes at the end of a long period of Northern reorientation. Northern Unionist reorientation away from the politics of Westminster towards popular mobilization. And yes, there are kind of some particularly important stimuluses towards this, like the constitutional reform in Britain uh, embodied in the Parliament Act of 1911. But I think there is a longer disengagement with uh, the London Parliament within Northern Unionism, uh, which is connected, in my view, in part with some of the fragmentation within the Northern enterprise that I mentioned briefly uh, earlier in my remarks. Again, a question that's asked and kicked around um, a a little bit is whether Carson introduced the gun into Irish politics. Well, um, I think what we can say is that he certainly helped to illegally introduce very large numbers of guns into Ireland and its politics in 1913, 1914. I think we can say that there's a case that he indirectly brought the gun into Redmondite politics in terms of the 
stimulus or interconnection between the Ulster volunteers and the Irish volunteers. But, of course, he's not the first militant Irish politician, nor is he the first to threaten militancy. The RB is being reformed at this time. And the point, I think, about Carson and militancy was not primarily that he was the first to introduce guns into Irish politics. It's rather that he's the first who deliberately wants to be seen introducing guns into Irish politics in terms of persuading that jury, metaphorically speaking, within the British Parliament and within British public opinion. And just as he pursues a high-risk brinkmanship in the courts, which is very much his style, so he does in politics, and so he does within Northern Unionism as well. Now, it's been suggested to me uh, that the question that uh, really needs answering is, does Carson reintroduce the gun into Irish politics? And I think this is a, 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 a more defensible proposition. But its force also depends on whether you believe that weaponry had effectively disappeared from Ireland in 1910. And it depends as well whether you believe that there was a smooth pathway between Carson's militancy in 1914 and the 1916 rising and the outbreak of the War of Independence in 1919. And I think it's possible to argue this, but in doing so there is uh, a major risk that uh, that other great conflagration, the First World War, is written out of the argument. Turning to that other, uh, uh, no less sensitive topic of partition, were Carson and Redmond the effective architects of the division of the island? Of course, neither Carson or Redmond invented partition uh, as a concept or even as a concept with an Irish application. It's privately mooted uh, alongside the first Home Rule Bill in 1886, and it had been given imperial applications within the empire long before 1912 in, uh, in Bengal, for example. As you will be uh, uh, doubtless aware, Carson is a driver of partition, while Redmond reluctantly acquiesces in an increasingly difficult range of partitionist proposals forced upon him by his liberal allies. And as is pretty well known, uh, they were ultimately divided. Redmond and Carson were ultimately divided, not by the principle of partition, which Redmond loathes and which Carson pretty much dislikes, they're divided by its practicalities and its potential application. Carson sought ultimately the indefinite exclusion of the uh, six counties from Home Rule, while by 1916 Redmond had moved to countenance a term-limited or otherwise clearly a temporary exclusion. But I'd like to just briefly highlight uh, a couple of points that perhaps might nudge us beyond these um, uh, well-known propositions. I think in some ways partition is uh, an example of the law of unintended consequences in politics. For Edward Carson, partition is a political tactic which becomes a compromise, which is reimagined later in his life and career as a fundamental lifelong goal. The unity of Ireland is pragmatically replaced in 1914-16 by the idea of a soft border, and then uh, in 1920 21 by that of a hard border. Carson begins as an all-Ireland unionist, But only from the autumn of 1913 onwards does he look to partition in his terms as a meaningful compromise. And only from 1920 onwards does he publicly and retrospectively define partition as the immutable objective of Northern Unionism. Carson lives long enough to be uh, very uh, attentive to the rewriting of his own history in a way that John Redmond just doesn't have the opportunity to do, given that Redmond dies suddenly in 1918, but Carson, despite his 
uh, complaints about health survives until, as I've said, 1935. For Redmond, of course, partition was an anathema and remains so. There's uh, a well-developed northern nationalist uh, uh, enterprise uh, led by uh, Joseph Devlin. And party and national unity were fundamental to the vision of politics that Redmond embraces in the wake of the Parnell split. And indeed, one of the central planks in the posthumous defense of Redmond that John Dillon launches uh, after 1918 was that Dillon had fought, that Redmond had fought partition tooth and nail, and that he had left Ireland united at the time of his death in 1918, and had therefore done more than those within the national tradition who had picked up the reins after 1918. While Redmond and Carson were famously uh, opposed on the national question, they both tentatively explored as many still do within the United Kingdom, the notion of federalism or explicitly shared sovereignty as a means of bridging their political positions. For Carson, federalism was a means of creating an Irish parliament within the overall context of a reformed union government for the UK. And for Redmond, federalism was a means of redefining the government of the whole empire. And federalism also works for Redmond within an exclusively Irish environment, allowing the North to enjoy perhaps a distinctive status, but not within the context of the United Kingdom, rather within an all-Ireland polity, rather than a British polity. Now, we know, of course, that Redmond's vision of Irish self-government uh, was superseded by that of Sinn Féin uh, at the time, well, before the time of his death, 100 years ago. We know that he died, a disappointed man. But Carson's public acceptance of the role of patriarch of Northern Ireland, which uh, flourished in the 1930s, concealed uh, a private but profound bitterness about the condition of all of Ireland in the 1920s. And this is repeated in private communications which lie behind the public persona that Carson offers the world. Already in 1918, Carson was writing privately that he had agreed to the exclusion of six counties, although I think that arrangement on statesmanlike and a poor solution. I think that arrangement on statesmanlike and a poor solution. Despite as patriarch of Northern Ireland, he wrote in 1922, I feel I am a citizen without nationality, or anything to be loyal to. In 1928, he confided that he thought there'd be more decency in a republic than in this free state humbug. In fact, I'd rather see a republic. He claimed no less strikingly in private at this time that his words, again, looking back at politics, I think we made a great mistake in not accepting Mr. Gladstone's first home rule bill. Looking back at politics, I think we made a great mistake in not accepting Mr. Gladstone's first home rule bill. So after a century, um, just to try and draw the different threads of this discussion uh, to a conclusion, after a century, it's surely worth reuniting these uh, two men analytically. In reality, I think neither can be fully understood without recourse to the other. Nor can each be fully understood without some recourse to the shape and the functioning of the Union state. Redmond's approach to a succession of fundamental issues, such as militancy and partition, the endorsement of the war effort, was at least in part influenced by Carson's actions and strategies. Carson's own actions in key areas were conditioned by a reading of a particular view of Irish nationalism and its relationship with British government, with successive union governments. At the end of the day, Redmond, I think, had vision, but lacked passion. Carson lacked vision, but he could provide the theatrical passion in spade loads. And all of this, I think, particularly matters just now. 
Of course, we're thinking about the centenary of Redmond's death in 2018, as Simon has said. But the careers of Redmond and Carson and the context to their activity have, I think, an ongoing contemporary resonance. The period of home rule, so dominated by these two, was one of unusual and concentrated political passion, not just for Ireland, but for Britain as well. It serves as a reminder that while the stability of the neighboring state, the UK, is often taken for granted, not least by the British themselves, there has been a history of threatened conflagration and near meltdown. The tone and political content uh, of discourse, the emotional charge of political discourse in Britain over Brexit and over Scottish independence, I think, bear some resemblance to those prevailing in 1910-1914. And this bitter passion was particularly um, true for Carson's conservative allies. Split as they were over Britain's trading relationship with the wider world, and in particular over the issue of free trade. In seeking to make Edwardian Britain great again, the Tories in 1912-14 turned to Irish unionism in the shape of Carson. Just as a minority Tory government has done with Arlene Foster and the DUP. Although paradoxically, Mrs. Foster, I think, might do better by studying not uh, the relationship between unionism and conservatism, but rather the costs borne by Redmond of the relationship with, uh, with liberalism. The era not only defined issues and problems of lasting importance, it threw up projected solutions which remain in play. And there were different versions, hard and soft, of what constituted partition. The partition envisioned in 1914 is very different from that enacted in uh, 1920, 1921. And as I mentioned earlier, many believed, including Redmond and Carson, that federalism, which is still very much a theme within British political discourse and reformist constitutional discourse in the UK at present, that federalism offered a kind of silver bullet to the United Kingdom's constitutional and wider problems. And last but not least, I think the story of Redmond and Carson has a particular relevance in an Ireland where the possibility of reunification has become uh, relatively stronger, to put it no more highly than that, than hitherto. And this is obviously because their lives are entangled with the early development of the partition question. It's also, I think, because the task of bringing the two of them together raises questions about what the history of Ireland might look like in the context of reunification, a reunified state. Carson fought for partition, yet believed ultimately that unity could be achieved uh, and would be achieved consensually. Redmond thought in terms of home rule within home rule for a unified Ireland, peacefully achieved. And given the recent headlines on Brexit and border polls and the possibility of a second referendum on Brexit, given uh, striking remarks from Peter Robinson on the possibility of thinking ahead in terms of Irish unity, given uh, Mary Lou MacDonald's raising of the possibility of, at the very least, putting Commonwealth engagement, Ireland's re-engagement with the Commonwealth, back on the table again. 2018 feels sometimes, and in some ways, less like a centenary commemoration and more like a revisiting or a rerun of uh, some of the themes at any rate of 100 years ago. Now, John Redmond was unquestionably a man of his time, looking as much backwards uh, as forwards, as much backwards into the 19th century as forwards into the 20th. And yet, who now can say whether Redmond damned for a century as worsted in the game, may come instead to be seen as a winner in 
a longer game of Irish history and of Irish unity. Thank you.